Nearly four years have passed since the nuclear accident at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi plant, but even as work proceeds on decommissioning the reactors, experts are still trying to grasp all the details of the disaster. They have made new discoveries about the radioactive substances released from the reactors. In today's Nuclear Watch, we'll tell you what they have found. On March 13, 2011, a U.S. aircraft carrier deployed off northeastern Japan detected an increase in the level of radiation in the atmosphere. The crew kept a running record of the data. NHK created this chart with help from a researcher who's been analyzing the information. Up until now, people looking into the accident had focused on the four days immediately after the disaster. That's because they thought the bulk of radioactive substances was released from the plant during that period. But the data analyzed by the researchers suggest something different. Only a quarter of the radioactive substances drifted during the first four days. The remaining 75 percent spread over the next two weeks. We analyzed why this happened. When the disaster hit, the nuclear plant lost its external power. That made electric pumps for injecting water into the reactors useless. So workers used fire engines to spray water into the reactors to keep them from melting down. The fire engines pumped out 30 tons of water every hour. But an in-house investigation by the plant's operator shows only about one ton per hour reached the targets. We conducted an experiment to see if this may have contributed to the massive release of radioactive fallout. Nuclear fuel is covered with a metal called zirconium. We heated the metal to a temperature of 1200 degrees Celsius the estimated temperature inside the reactors when the accident happened. We then poured traces of vapor onto the metal to simulate water from that fire engines. Instead of dropping, the temperatures of the metal quickly began to climb. In two minutes, it surged by 78 degrees. Experts suspect this is why large amounts of radioactive substances escaped over an extended time. Fuel keeps melting slowly as zirconium generates a relatively large amount of heat. The metal remained hot for some time. This means radioactive materials will be released for a longer time. The experiment shows the water that was meant to prevent the meltdowns may have actually sustained them. The expert says the result shows that radioactive substances kept leaking out and spreading into the atmosphere. NHK World's Kenichiro Okamoto has been following the story and tells us what he has learned. Several independent panels investigated the accident. Some were appointed by the government, others by the diet or private groups. The members tried to figure out why no one was able to control the situation. They focused on the four to five days after the disaster, when TEPCO failed to prevent the reactors from melting down. Radiation levels around the Fukushima Daiichi reactors remain extremely high, and no one has been able to get close enough to determine what's happening inside. And it's possible there may still be more data to analyze about radioactive substances released from the plant. This explains why experts believe it will take several decades to get a complete picture of what happened. In the meantime, everyone needs to keep in mind that no nuclear plant is perfectly safe. 
and members of the media need to keep watching the situation and report on future developments as they happen. During my visit to Japan this week, uh, people have asked me from time to time, you know, are there technologies in the U.S. that can help solve this problem? Uh, the reality is that there is no technology that exists anywhere to solve this problem. It has to be developed. It has to be done with research. Um, it will take time. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has been having a hard time dealing with contaminated water. Last week, officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company announced they wouldn't be able to meet their deadline for decontamination work. They say groundwater entering the facility becomes tainted when it mixes with melted fuel inside the reactor containers. TEPCO engineers believe some of the fuel has cooled down and turned into solid debris. But they don't know the exact situation, so they're hoping to take a look inside with the help of a high-tech imaging system. NHK World's Noriko Okada reports. These flashing streaks of light show traces of a particle called a muon. Muons rain down on us from space. Each minute, about 10,000 of them land on every square meter of the Earth. Scientists have figured out a way of using muons to help them see substances hidden from view like magma. The technique is a type of imaging known as muon tomography. When the particles hit a high-density object like magma, they lose energy or are absorbed. Scientists can measure this outcome to determine the shape of the substance. It's like an X-ray. Researchers are hoping to use the technique to get a better idea of what's inside the reactors. We expect to be able to check the presence of heavy materials, even if radiation levels are so high that we can't approach the area. Engineers will use detectors to try and determine the state of the melted fuel. Researchers did a similar experiment at a different nuclear power plant in 2012 and 2013. They were able to catch images of spent fuel in a pool inside the reactor building. On Wednesday, workers at Fukushima will try to repeat that success. They are scheduled to set up a pair of detectors outside the number one reactor. Engineers say knowing what's inside will help them figure out a way to decommission the plant and put an end to the problem of contaminated water.
dairy producers in Japan are looking for a way to sweeten their bottom line. They've developed fruit that packs a lot of flavor, and they're now figuring out how to get it into the mouths of new customers around the world. This is not a strawberry. It's a skyberry. Bigger, sweeter, juicier, and a lot more expensive, too. Almost $5 a piece. Not so outrageous in Japan, where fruit often serves as an upscale gift for special occasions. The Skyberry is one of the flagship products of Tochigi, the most famous region for Japanese strawberries. Despite the hefty price, it's been selling well since it hit the market in 2012. So much so, producers now want to ship their little red queens to the kingdom of La Cuisine, France. I hope our strawberries can spread their wings and go on sale outside Japan. Shipping strawberries halfway across the world is a difficult challenge. It takes just a few days for the fruit to start losing its luster. And it's also extremely delicate. That's why producers enlisted the help of researchers at a local university to develop the best possible packaging. The team devised a simple design, a resin base, a thin cushion, and a protective shell. The stem is pinned to the base, so the strawberry doesn't move around. It can even withstand being turned upside down. The next step was a comparative crash test. Here are the results with a standard package. Special lighting reveals considerable damage. And here's what a skyberry looks like after being dropped in its protective shell. Safe and sound. Last year, a first batch of skyberries was sent to France. The outcome was promising. The fruit showed no traces of damage, and it still looked fresh after 10 days. The question now is, will it sell? Remember, one skyberry costs about $5. Add two more for the shell, then shipping and handling, and the price tag in France will reach $15 per unit. The leaders of the project say they're quite optimistic. I think our best chance is to market the skyberry as something completely different from traditional strawberries. Producers will now be counting on the high expectations of French palates to take the skyberry even higher. <laughs>